The original Xbox was a formidable console, HD resolutions, great games and sprawling worlds. But just what was powering this little box? This right here is the original Xbox, and as I just said a few seconds ago, it was once the most powerful console of its generation, and by quite a long shot too, in fact it was the most powerful console in the world. Now what I put in front of you is one I picked up for a fiver from the local boot fair, so why don't we crack this big boy open and find out what's powering this beast. So inside this machine, once we get past the copious amounts of dust, we can see that what's powering it isn't actually all too shabby. At the heart of it all we have the processor which is a copper mine based Pentium 3 clocking in at 733 MHz. But it's not quite that simple, see people call it a Celeron sometimes due to its cut cache, but technically the CPU is for all intents and purposes still a Pentium 3 core. It just has half of that 256 kilobytes of L2 cache disabled. Everything else remains unchanged from an off the shelf Pentium 3, the only difference really being that it's soldered to the motherboard. But you can upgrade it if you desolder it, but we'll talk about that more later, that's not really what this is about. Still, you can't run everything off a processor. Well, you can, but ideally you want some graphics, especially for a console. And this is where it gets very interesting with the original Xbox. See, the NV2A, that's what powers it. And keep in mind this was 2001. Well, the NV2A is about as powerful as it gets for that year. See, it's based on the respectable GeForce 3 series, with raw performance placing it near the top spot TI chips of the day. However, for those of you who like the tech specs behind it, you'll notice the original Xbox has two vertex shaders, double what the GeForce 3 had. That the console was sort of this weird GeForce 3 4 amalgamation. It's a hybrid type chip that we wouldn't exactly see on the PC until the official release of the GeForce 4 series. So, you know, it's, it's pretty powerful by 2001 standards on the graphics side. The only other things to mention are minor areas, it has 64 megabytes of RAM, yes, megabytes of RAM, but it does clock in at a very respectable 400 megahertz, which isn't bad at all. All the encoding is done on the onboard Dolby compliant video encoders, which can be a blessing to get video output of, however some of the later models do tend to have a few issues. Then again, for a console this old, it can support all the way up to 1080i, and you've got the hard drive, which is very useful to save your games, and much easier than a memory card, and actually acts as a cache for your own games that you're running, meaning some game's performance is dramatically helped by using the hard disk drive's cache directly for loading certain assets and levels. I mean, it definitely opens the eye to what the original Xbox was doing down on a lower level. I mean, even the DVD drive is designed around the original Xbox specifications. Did you know the original Xbox DVD drives reach the outer layers at a higher speed, which helps the original Xbox load games faster? I mean, original Xbox games are mastered with the majority of their data on the outside edge, meaning you get a five times read speed. It's not exactly tons of read speed, but still, it's a nice increase that helps with loading, and all this is wrapped up into a nice little box, which isn't too shabby whatsoever. Although I'm not going to pretend the Xbox is without its own issues. For starters, to store the time and date, it uses a capacitor known as the clock capacitor, which can leak and end up breaking the motherboard by eating through it with acid. Unless, of course, you have a Final Revision 1.6 Xbox, where this doesn't yet happen. Although keep in mind that those 1.6 Xboxes have their own issues. They have the worst video encoders available. So they can have issues displaying certain games in a non-interlace mode, and then again some games won't even start properly. They also have some weird DVD drives across the Xbox range. They use Samsung, Philips, Thompson, and of course, if you have a Thompson drive, well, you know, it usually has issues reading discs by now. This Xbox that we're using today has a Thompson drive, and even then I did have to clean it up a little bit to get it working, and admittedly, it's working all right now. But still, you understand what I mean. They're not great. If you have an older Samsung drive, well, the drawers end up dropping, and you need to give them a good old thwack to get them back open, and the hard drive... Well, if that gets damaged at all, then your loading times are going to be very long and your game's performance will suffer, as the games are designed around having a nice hard drive. In fact, I've even done some testing, which we'll touch on later on, just to show this in action. Then again, this is the original Xbox, and we've already touched on how powerful it is. Why don't we see what actually happens when you put it to the test?
so on to our next chapter. We've established just how powerful the original Xbox is. I mean, it's got a lot of power tucked into that little 2000s box. But just how well does this translate into games? Well, the Xbox has quite a library, from RPGs to adventure games through to puzzles and platformers. You know, we aren't here for the games, though. We just want to see how far some of these titles can push the original Xbox to its limits. Or, well, the ones that look pretty impressive either way. So why don't we start, you know, at the deep end with one of my favourite games of all time, which is a very impressive looking game, considering this is 2001 hardware we're dealing with. Now, I'm not going to claim it's a flawless experience in any way, as it can look rather janky and dated in certain areas with some of the animations, but with a day and night cycle, some of the atmosphere, and some of the decent particle effects, real-time shadows, you know, the game does look very nice, although performance can suffer with how large the scope is for the game. It was an ambitious project, it's a large world, it's very detailed, and because of this, with a lot of people on screen, it can suffer. Although I've played this through countless times on the original Xbox and it's definitely fully playable, so I'd definitely put this up there with one of the better games on the original Xbox. One game I always found to be extremely impressive for the original Xbox was the original Forza, and it is quite the show. I mean, firstly, let's get this out of the way. The frame rate is rock solid. I couldn't get the game to drop a single frame in my entire time playing it, with large crashes or anything like that. You know, the game is rock solid. Then again, you know, the game is also very impressive in how it looks, from the models to the controls, the game has a level of polish that you didn't really see in some of those early racing games. And with a clever mixture of arcade-style racing and a tycoon-style career mode, it's no wonder the series is still going. Then again, you know, when you actually look at the scenery and how well the game translates onto the original Xbox in terms of how good it looks, you know, it's a good game, and I'd definitely play it. A game that is never frequently brought up when talking about the original Xbox is Just Cause. I mean, the original game came out on the PS2 and the original Xbox. But it's one of those games which makes a great case for what the Xbox was good at, having the better version of those games. The frame rate is rock solid, you know, compared to the PS2 version at least, it's got better quality graphics and more stable frame rate, and it's a very ambitious game. I mean, the game world is huge. It's a very polished game in most areas in terms of controls and animations, and although it's janky in a few places, you know, it's a solid contender for one of the good final Xbox games. It's one of those games that came out on the Xbox 360 but still ran nice enough on the last gen, provided you weren't playing the PS2 version. Talking about the original Xbox getting the better version of games, we have Splinter Cell's Chaos Theory, which is, you know, a right classic in every area. It's very good looking with brilliant gameplay, but, you know, the shadows, the lighting, the larger levels compared to the GameCube and PS2 versions, a rock solid frame rate, it's just a better game all round on the Xbox compared to the other consoles. Now, I'm not going to claim the other games aren't a miracle in the first place because they do look very good, but the original Xbox version just pulls ahead in these areas. It's a game that's aged perfectly, it's got a co-op mode, and it's honestly one of my top games of all time, and it plays very well on the original Xbox. Then, of course, you have some of the early titles, and yes, I fully understand Morrowind at first glance is not a pretty looking game. However, although it's not pretty, it is a huge game. And by that, I mean the game world, the opportunities, the immersion, it's insane, the levels of detail in this game. And there's a reason why it only came to the original Xbox and no other consoles of that era. You know, when you look at it, it's not that bad in some areas. The water's nice and some of the reflections implemented are really, really good. So I suppose you could say it's one of those games that's impressive in terms of scope, although not one of the prettiest. The frame rate is relatively stable. I mean, it's uncapped, although it is definitely playable. But it's one of those games that even when you play it on backwards compat on, say, the Xbox One X, it can struggle then. So it's one of those games that was very impressive at the time, although if you're seeking a high frame rate, you might not find it here. So by this point, I'm sure you get the point. It doesn't matter what you're playing on the original Xbox, 
It has it all, at least most of the good games. Halo was started on the original Xbox and is a rock solid example of how well an FPS can age and it's flawless to play and my favourite one of the series, the second one is available. It's on the console and it runs beautifully and looks pretty good too. You've got obscure titles like Phantom Crash, which no one ever talks about but I enjoy playing, which is like Forza but with mechs and this weird career mode with a decent soundtrack and no one's ever heard of it and I should probably make a video on it. A game that virtually no one's played. Then again you've got classics like Sid Meier's Pirates, which was ported perfectly to the Xbox, although the frame rate is a little bit less than stable in certain areas, but the controls and just how well the game works is pretty impressive in its own right, so I'd see past this. You've got feature length RPGs like KOTOR, which once again does have a few strange frame rate issues, but is a very good looking game and has huge levels of scope with multiple planets, maps, great dialogue, combat, a brilliant story, and then you've got games like Sims 2, which run in HD. I know it's a bit odd that it runs in HD considering it did struggle on this generation of consoles, but then again, the frame rate isn't what this game's about, and you can make it more stable if you play in standard definition, but still, the fact it runs in HD is nice when you want to play co-op and you could do with a larger resolution for each side of the screen. That's the really weird thing about the original Xbox, it was created in this era where we got some of my personal favourite games. So if I wanted to play them on a console, there's no reason why I'd need anything else other than the original Xbox, because it just runs better. But then you have a few games that really couldn't have been done on any other console, even if you really tried. Doom 3 now, it's not a conventional Doom game, but it's getting a lot of media press nowadays because of how good the ports are and how good it still looks, and it was revolutionary for the PC back in the day. But this is where things have progressed quite a lot since 2001 when the Xbox came out. But they did it. The developers managed to get this game, Doom 3, which is huge, running on the original Xbox, and it runs decently well. I'm not going to say it's the best aging game of all time, but you know... It's very impressive how they managed to squeeze this onto the original Xbox, but I only thought I'd touch on this briefly. The main star of the show is Half-Life 2, which they got in its entirety on the original Xbox. See, this game, it wasn't cut down at all. It wasn't modified other than a few other lower resolution textures and maybe a few file format changes. This was the full fat Half-Life 2 experience, really something that's so huge it deserved to be in its own feature length video. But this little 2001 box is able to run possibly one of the best FPS games of all time. And you know what? It doesn't do a bad job at it. The game utilises hard drive based caching quite a lot for certain files, which helps speed up loading. One area that it really does struggle in, as the Xbox does only have 64 megabytes of RAM, but still, it's very impressive how well they do it. They nailed the physics effects, the beautiful lighting, the superbly animated character models, and the conversion all round. Well, you know, it deserves a video of itself, so I may do one if people want to see one. And I might just cover how they pulled it off. I mean, the frame rate, don't get me wrong, it can suffer at times, but the experience is so immersive that you don't even notice it. In fact, the first time I played Half-Life 2 was on the original Xbox, and it's just this weird and wonderful original Xbox port that pushed it to its limit in every way. Then again... There are a lot of games that push the original Xbox to its limit. It's a great console, it was powerful, and it really did have some good looking titles. But what happened when this little box was opened up to the homebrew community and they got a hold of the console? Which brings us now to the next chapter. So one of the huge things about the original Xbox was how easy it was to soft mod. In fact, it was so easy to do that I've bought Xboxes from the boot fair and other places and they've come pre-soft modded because so many people did it because of how easy it is to do. It's not exactly what I want to spend too much time covering, but how it works is that you copy over a Linux installer and a modded save game, which works in a few titles and I chose to use Mech Assault. Then, when you load the save file, the Xbox will run unsigned code. In this case, a Linux installer. And that's it. You'll spend more time getting hold of a memory stick and a USB adapter than you will actually spending time modding the system. See, there's also other mods, known as hard mods, because they actually involve you opening up the console, and include everything from adding a custom LCD display on the front of the box, larger hard drives, RAM upgrades to 128 megabytes found often on the dev kits, which allows you to run some more high-end homebrew, and then you got things like high-end CPU upgrades, which includes pushing the console up to a whopping 1.4 GHz processor. But that's a very hard mod to do, you need some patches to make it work properly, and not everyone has the details of how to do it. 
But it's not like the scene ends there. No, there are people trying to tap into the original Xbox's encoder to try and output a direct digital signal from the original Xbox, which actually gives some surprising increase in quality in certain titles, at least if you're going to be displaying it on a modern TV. Then again, you know, why don't I show you some of the useful things that I think are quite important on a modded Xbox and just a quick summary of what you can actually get up to. So firstly, one of the features I use a lot of the time is being able to install games to a hard drive. Now you can upgrade this hard drive if you want to install more, but on this video I even just use the stock size, as you can fit a couple of games on there. Now as I mentioned, the Xbox had a great way of utilising the cache on the hard drive to load games and assets. In fact you can even see the cache when you turn on your Xbox, provided it's modded, and it's listed under the Z drive on the original Xbox. So it's only natural that when you install a game like this, it not only helps with loading, but can also help with performance in certain instances. Now I'm not going to claim it's going to save your games that have really bad frame rates, but it can add a slightly more stable experience to some of the more uncapped ones, and you know, help all round with loading times either way. And it also means you don't wear out your aging original Xbox DVD drive. From here you'll end up with areas like emulators, and I know what a lot of people think, it's a 2001 PC, or at least equivalent to that in power. Why would I want to emulate anything on this box? Well, see, the thing is, a lot of emulators have been ported to the original Xbox, and you know what? It doesn't do a half bad job performance-wise. But my main argument why it's not a bad shout is that most of the emulators have controls mapped over to the original Xbox controller, which makes it a blind sight easier to play them, and you don't really need to do much configuration, as it's a kind of a plug-and-play configuration for all Xboxes. You've got everything from the N64, which I personally think works brilliantly for most titles, through to areas like the PS1. Now, don't get me wrong, the consoles do have have some intense titles out there, and these emulators can only work so well on limited 2001 hardware. Well, powerful 2001 hardware. So you get the idea, you can end up with a few instances where it's not stable and the performance is exactly, you know, a bit subpar. But personally, I think the Xbox doesn't do a bad job at it. You've got some really obscure emulators on the console, I mean you've got a DS emulator on an Xbox, and they aren't exactly renowned for their stability or performance, but still, they do work, just very slowly. Handheld consoles generally before the DS do work absolutely fine, and in fact it's not a bad way to play through some of the games as you get a nice controller, you can have higher resolution outputs, filters, speed up, I know it works relatively trouble free on the Xbox. So if you want a little emulation box from the 90s and early handhelds, it's not a bad shout. All I can think of other than this is areas like media encoding, which isn't bad, but honestly, and I know this is going to sound controversial to some people, keep it to a CRT. It's a neat idea in theory, having all your media done on the original Xbox, but the Xbox can struggle with higher resolutions, modern codecs, web decoding, and yes, you've got XBMC for Xbox, which still has add-on support and some nice skins, but really, you know, it's a fully-fledged dashboard, and you can FTP into the Xbox to mess around with it still, but I find it to be a little bit intensive in certain places, unless you're just using it for your game library and emulators. Other than that, you know, you can run Linux, but that'll be a subject for another day. And honestly, if you're just playing DVDs and want it hooked up to a CRT, maybe some older web files, things like that, you know, and it's not half bad. The original Xbox, it does a lot. So there we have it, the original Xbox, and all this was filmed on one that I picked up for just a fiver from the boot fair. So I'm not going to argue with you on just how well it worked, as we've seen how well it works. And yes, it does have a few issues, but if you're familiar with a PC, you can figure out exactly what's going on. And you know what? You're looking at a pretty well-running system. Even then, if you don't mod your system, you can get some great games running on a stock system. Yes, I just said system again. And it's got an aspect of simplicity that modern consoles just lack. It's got some great titles, and really, well, you know, I just feel this was worth giving a little bit of a send-off to one of my favourite consoles of all time. And even now, it's just resided to being found on the ground for next to nothing price-wise. I hope you've all enjoyed this little bit of a look at and how powerful it was and what it can actually do. And if you'd like to see me do another one on a different console, I would love to investigate these more. As I think, you know, a lot of these consoles deserve a little bit of an in-depth look at in 2019. At least as well as I can make one. Because this video took a while to make because I've never made a proper console video before. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this. Good night.
So fellas, there you have it. This project was a huge undertaking. I'm gonna be honest here, this took a long time to make with some of the things I had to teach myself, you know, the frame rate analysis, things like that. But anyway, it's done. I hope you enjoyed it and let me know if you want some more.